Great. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of your Box podcast. Have you ever wondered or ever thought about unlocking your own macro type or what actually it is in the first place? Well, today, my friends, I'm delighted to welcome Christine Horonic. Now, for those of you that don't know who she is, she's an award-winning, get this, biochemical engineer, wow, <laughs> and three-time champion fitness competitor, nutritionist, and she's a ex- expert exercise person as well. Christine uses a background in serious science to develop her best-selling body type programs, which have been helped thousands of people all across the world, I believe. She founded her company called Gorge Girl Training, if I got that right, uh, in 2013, and she has helped approximately 40,000 women transform their bodies and switch to body positive images. She has a new book coming out, I believe, on the 8th of March, which is just around the corner. Very, very excited about this one. Unlock your macro type. Identify your true body type. Understand your carb tolerance. Accelerate fat loss. Christine, I could go further and further into (laughs) your incredible bio, but welcome so much to the Storybox podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much for making the time. I've been looking forward to this conversation with you ever since I found out that, you know, you're writing a book and I get to speak with you. So thank you uh, mm. so much for, for being available. And this is a, it's a topic that I am fascinated in actually being a, somewhat of a health nerd myself <laughs> and interested in the body and how it works and, and all that. Before we dive further into that and, and your backstory, the very first question that I do have for you is what does success look like for you? Um, I think success looks like being able to help others. I mean, I think the reason why we're all here is to, is to facilitate helping other people find the greatness from within themselves. And I think that so many times as people, like I find like I, some of our greatest breakthroughs come through helping each other. I can't tell you how many times things have changed in my life or the positive because other people's influence in my life, people have been able to help me unlock gifts and have been able to guide me or mentor me in different ways. And I think success looks like being able to pay it forward in the same capacity. When was the moment for you, Christine, that you realized that in fact was success for you? Has it been this gradual thing over time that you've realized at a different points or was there more of a catalyst moment somewhere for you? Um, I, I think honestly, it's, it's kind of been an accumulative thing. I used to measure success very differently in a very materialistic, very worldly type of way. But I think at the end of the day, you can have all the success in the world. You can have all the money in the world. You can have every resource at your fingertips. End of the day, we're all just people and it's people helping people. I've been around some of the most world famous people on the planet and, you know, not necessarily the most people that are on the up and up, I actually want to be around. And then likewise, I've been around some, some folks who, you know, they're just good people that just want to help others who want nothing in return. And I just think that the significance of that, like being around people of substance, as opposed to people of sizzle, it's just, it's just a really, that's all I want. I don't want to be around the BS, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because what's the point, right? It's just, exactly. You're wasting exactly. your time. You're wasting their exactly. time. And exactly. you don't feel any better as a result. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I kind of relate to what you're saying. Yeah. It's more, it's better to be authentically true to you so that you're not lying to yourself and then you're not feeling even more miserable as a result exactly. than continue to fake it and, quote, get something from people and making it and, no oh dear, yes. So bit, all that all that stuff that the world teaches you these days. Yes. For <laughs> so, sure. So did you tell me how you grew up a little bit? Like what was it like for you growing up? Did you always want to be a, a biochemical engineer? And what is that? To be honest? Um, I think it it's funny. Um, I'm half Filipino. Um, so my mom's uh Filipino. If anyone knows anything about like Asian mothers, um, their children are going to be doctors, engineers, <laughs> like what you know, my mom told me at fifth grade, you're gonna be a chemical engineer. And I actually um wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be a painter. 
And, um, you know, I excelled in school. I always got very good grades. Um, I, I would actually get grounded for A minuses. And, you know, I have my mom to thank for pushing me and steering me on that path. I didn't always want to do it at times. But the thing is, as I grew in it, as it taught me the disciplines, you know, obviously, um, university and grad school was very rigorous. It got me a really good job at DuPont. And the thing is, I fell in love with it because I actually didn't really fall in love with it until I learned how to take my knowledge of science and apply it to people in like personally impacting people's health because I was doing stuff in the labs. I was doing stuff in the plants. I've built several manufacturing plants. I owned my own manufacturing plant before I ever got into any of this and built it from the ground up. But the thing is, if you're not touching lives, if you're not dealing with people, seeing that science help people, that's where it just, everything changed for me. It all changed for me once I had that personal connection. Where was the the crossover between, okay, I, I love science. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm interested in science, but I'm also interested in fitness and nutrition. Where did that crossover happen and, and what sort of was the catalyst for that? Um, I did a fitness competition. My first one was in 2012. And, you know, for a couple of years at functioning as a food scientist in the dietary supplement industry, um, had my own company. I started drinking the Kool-Aid, so to speak. And I challenged myself to do a fitness competition because I always wanted to be one of those really fit women, you know, like I remember Jamie Eason was one of the first really fit models back in like the, the, the two thousands is before like being fit was really in and popular. And I was like, dang, I want to look like that. I wanted to look like her. I wanted to look like Janet Jackson. And I didn't, I couldn't do it. And it made me so angry because I do everything, anything I put my mind to, I do like grades, school, career, this, this, this. I couldn't do it. I couldn't figure it out. And it made me so angry. So it was a personal like challenge to myself. What am I doing wrong? What variables am I missing here? I used to be a marathon runner and I just thought you just had to work harder, pave the pavement harder, just more, 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 but more wasn't more. It wasn't about running more. It wasn't about burning more calories. It was about the correct calories. It was about training in a certain way. And it was a game changer for me. So that was the catalyst that really started to bridge the gap because I'm learning and applying all this stuff to myself, started to figure it out. And then as I figured it out, everyone started asking me questions and I would practice talking about it online. Um, I would talk about it on Instagram, but then there used to be this platform before Instagram live, before Facebook live, it was called Periscope. I'm not sure if you remember it. Um, I did a Periscope every single day for 365 days between 2015 and 2016. And I was so nervous because you're live and all everyone's asking you questions. And I would write these scripts for myself for two hours of everything I would say, because I didn't want to sound stupid, like being put on the spot. And all of that practice, I was like, if I'm going to waste all this energy, the scopes disappear in a day, mm. you know? So I'm like, I might as well record YouTube videos so it at least stays up there longer. And then I started cracking the YouTube game and it was hard. I mean, a lot of research, a lot of effort. I mean, I only had like 2000 followers for years. And then again, when I got really serious about it in 2016, that's when my channel blew up. I had um, one video go viral and it was about body types. And that just opened the doors for everybody to pay attention to my content. And it just only grew from that point onward. I'll get to the body types in just a moment, but I want to get back a little bit to understanding fitness because Mm -hmm. the world is, is evolving all the time. It's constantly changing. I've, I've noticed. And so what used to be classed as being fit is now no longer classed as being fit. There's so many different types of being fit So Mm -hmm. how do we define fitness today? (laughs) I guess, what is the right way or the right definition to class fitness as? I I think that you you have to be really careful because this, this can, this is where it gets tricky with like the whole body positive movement, because there are functional definitions of health, 
right? You know, the body should not have elevated blood sugar levels. You shouldn't have an A1C over this. I don't know how my, how I feel about body BMI because it doesn't take into account your body composition, but I think fit means, you know, you're, you're living a healthy lifestyle. You're getting activity for your heart. You're utilizing fitness to manage stress. You make a point to be active. And I think what that looks like in everyone's life is going to look different. I mean, not everybody's going to be a Tom Brady. Not everybody's going to be at the peak of athletic conditioning, nor does everybody have to. But I do think that there should be a standard of just health and wellness that's maintained just for well-being. Yeah. Do you think that, say, for example, people that are of a larger stature, they should mm-hmm be exercising more? Absolutely. I mean, there, there's just no doubt about it. I mean, our bodies were built to move. We weren't sit designed to be sedentary, just looking at a screen for eight plus hours a day. It's just not healthy. You know, like you need to move, you need to have circulation, you need for so many reasons. Mm. Is the Is the body positivity movement, is that a good thing or is it, I don't know, that much about it to be honest but is it a good thing or is it a bad thing because in in one sense i guess they would be teaching larger women to just accept their bodies for the way they are you don't really need to exercise that much or am i completely out of line out of step i don't understand it i don't want yeah, to take I mean, everyone you know, off there's a double-edged sword so the whole point is love yourself as you are and i think that that's a very wonderful positive message However, it can be taken out of context where it's like, okay, this means that you should never make an intentional effort to improve your health. However, I do believe you can't hate yourself into a better body. I've, I've struggled with poor self-image for so long. I, even when I was at my fittest, I'd still be beating myself up, be thinking like, oh, you still this, there's still this, there's still this, like picking myself apart. And it's like, when, when is enough enough? And I think that so many women specifically and, and men, obviously, like we just are so hard on ourselves. And I feel like health, healthy living needs to be from a foundation of self-love, self-care. And until you can embrace where you're at right now and say, you know what? I love myself. This is where I'm at. I'm going to do the best to improve as opposed to, man, I, I, I F and hate myself. I got to do something about this. I'm disgusting. I'm gross. This is miserable. No one will ever want me. Da, 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 da. Like that, that's just not healthy. That's toxic. That's so negative. So I think we need to look at it as, you know what? I love me as I am. This is where I'm at. I'm going to do my best. And keep taking it from there to make positive improvements. How have you been able to learn more or less how to love your own body so that you can use it in the most optimal possible way in life? I I think that learning to love yourself is embracing yourself, being truly authentic with who you are and where you're at. I used to have so much shame after my, my era of fitness competitions when I wasn't in contest shape anymore, right? Which is obviously unsustainable. <laughs> like I, I was sub 10% body fat and I started to develop some body dysmorphia thinking something was wrong with me. Mm-hmm. I, I thought I didn't look good anymore, even though I knew I wasn't fat, I thought I didn't look good. So with, with that being said, as I began to embrace the number on the scale going up, embrace what it is being honest with my my followers and audience saying, I don't look like this 24 seven. This is what I do look like. And that's okay. Being able to talk about my weight gain because like I'm by no means overweight, but I weigh more than what I did when I competed. And that's okay. And I think being able to just be honest about it, it was just so liberating because I didn't feel like I needed to post a picture of something that I'm not anymore. You know, so many people, this is pop common in the fitness industry. You know, they'll post pictures of themselves on from competition day or from a photo shoot, but like, that's not what you look like right now. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And, but that's okay. Just be, just be. And people appreciate that honesty so much more than just faking perfection. And once I realized I was able to help more people by being authentic, 
there's just, there's just no better feeling. Like uh, that is where people actually get helped. Like, I'm not here to like, just have a fan club, <laughs> like, you know, who needs that? That doesn't do anything other than stroke my ego. That doesn't functionally do anything. Yeah. I think looking at social media as a way, I guess, to feel better about yourself mm-hmm. is, is yeah. not a great thing to do because what well, you're so not common, understanding, though. I know it is. And that's what mm-hmm. I did for a long time yeah. as well. Um, I look at CrossFitters and think, you know, why can't I get a, a body that looks exactly like that? Because I was doing mm-hmm. CrossFit and I wanted that, you know, year round, good looking body, but mm-hmm. it is so much hard work <laughs> and I didn't understand nutrition properly, sure. you know, all these things. So I struggled for a long time to love myself and then toxic um, masculinity and, mm-hmm. and looking at all these social media icons and thinking, you know, I'll never get to that level, all that sort of stuff. It, it just affected me in all, all bad ways, but I didn't understand that most of those people have professional photographers. They're editing the mm-hmm. photos, uploading them later. They're at their, their, peak time during the week there's no inflammation whatsoever they've you know probably fasted they've you know just to look that certain way for the photo so it's it's a crazy world (laughs) it really is it absolutely is and i think that it's important that we're sharing that on our platforms and you know because we need to move away from vanity metrics and actually help people like that's what we kind of what you asked me about in the beginning like what the success looks like like because when you're working side by side with somebody and they're like, because of you, my life is better. That's just priceless. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've been moved to tears, like how many people whose lives I know are better as a result of our interactions with each other. Like that, that that's the real purpose in, in my eyes. You've helped over, I believe over 40,000 women. I'm sure you've got, you've helped men as well. Yes. What goes through your mind? Because that's not a small number. So what goes through your mind every time that that number either gets read out to you or you just help another person? I I just, I look at it like, it's like my duty. Um, it just, once you know better, you, you do better. Like I, I felt like I owed it to people to, sh- I, 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 I owe it to the world to share what I know. You know what I'm saying? So I don't really look at that number as like a, an ego stroke. I look at that. It's just like, it's a duty. I look at it as a duty to share what I know. Like, so, you know what I'm saying? Like when you know better, you know better. And it's just, there's so many people who don't know better They're They are confused. They are doing things all kinds of backwards. And when you know better, you just share it, mm. Like you know, is that what, keeps you going to do this, to keep the work Um, going? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because the thing is, you know, the knowledge we have on nutrition and science, it's always changing. It's always evolving. But if I can help somebody contextualize that for their life in a practical way, in a way they need it, like, you know, so-and-so is doing X and they're doing it just completely wrong and backwards. And they have no clue what they're doing wrong because, if we could talk about doctors for a second, I have so many clients who come to me all backwards and confused from science of, of what the doctors are telling them, like just the poor bedside manner, because on top of all of this, it's science, but it needs to be taken with a lot of empathy, a lot of compassion for people, because you know how many people have been dealing with these body image issues their whole life. They're told by doctors to take this pill. Like, you know what I'm saying? And then not only that, like they just need some encouragement. Like, so it's just, I, I especially see women just really needing just a patient person to really just take all this knowledge and funnel it in a way that makes practical sense for them. Yeah. You mentioned something very interesting that I did want to get into. Mm-hmm. I, I think it would be a good idea to get into it now because you know, the, the science is constantly changing. The, the information yeah. is, is just like, it's like, there's new studies, everything coming out all the time. Like this is what a proper diet, this is what optimal weight looks like. This is what you should be doing. And it confuses the heck out of a lot of people. I know that I get confused mm-hmm. quite a bit. So how do we know what is the right 
form of diet, exercises. Uh, I think it does it come down to understanding, I guess, what you're talking about, a macro type first and foremost. Yes, absolutely. And I feel like macro typing, which is a, a new term that I've created, is a really good way to provide context to these things. Every diet, every diet book that was ever written worked for the person who wrote it. Mm. But the problem is if it works for you and it doesn't apply for other people, why? And this is where as a chemical engineer, you know, my engineering background allows me to look at things more objectively, more regarding variables, process, flow in, out. So like if something's not working for somebody else, what are those underlying factors and variables and in a way that makes sense for the masses? So for example, when I had my success, I was doing a bodybuilder approach, which I, which I call high protein, low fat, moderate carb. It worked great for me. And then it worked great. It worked great as long as I was coaching people who had a very similar body type as me, similar body biochemistry as me. But then as my clientele started to expand into, you know, we have some women going into menopause. We have people with hormone issues. We have people who have just all kinds of conditions. What worked for me wasn't working anymore. So I'm asking myself, well, why not? Like, why doesn't it work for that person? And then once I started to understand, hey, there are underlying reasons and I've been able to carve out these paths called macro types to contextualize all of it, to make it make sense. Because I've carved out about five different paths that I've seen historically work over working with these 40,000 people, which have all been really wonderful data points. Mm -hmm. And I can probably put anybody in one of those buckets. I've never seen anyone fall outside of that. And I think it's just, it's really interesting to be able to know, okay, what variables impact how you should be eating. And what I've discovered, the number one thing is your relationship with carbohydrates. And I call it your carb tolerance level. Um, there's a spectrum. There's going to be some folks who can eat tons of carbs, need them, can eat an extreme amount, have nothing happen to them. Folks on the other end, they're type two diabetic. They have to have an extreme management of their carbs. But there's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a huge spectrum of people's relationship to carbohydrates. And it can be quantified in a meaningful way by asking pointed questions. And because I've worked with so many people in this like one-on-one -on -one capacity, it's like, okay, what happens under these circumstances? If you consume carbs for breakfast, how does your body respond in about an hour or two? And like, the more I, I worked with people, I started getting better at predicting how somebody was going to respond to their macros. So that's the whole premise of unlocking your macro types. It's honestly a way to simplify the context as to how to figure out how you should really be setting up your numbers. Well, I, for one, love my carbs. I love my fat. I'm not a massive fan on protein, believe it or not. <laughs> I just find the foods that associate themselves with carbs and fat is just, outstanding. <laughs> um, like, yeah, I probably have a bad habit with cookies. Not, I'm not saying yeah. you should. No, it's funny cookies, though. But, um, anyway, I, I'm curious why, why look at more or less the macro side of things more than the micro is the micro more important than the macro is the macro more important than the micro. I find that the macro is more important than the micro because it enables you to kind of guide the big picture. Micronutrients, of course, are important. However, the macronutrients are the nutrients the body needs in large quantities. They are the proteins, the carbs, and fats for very functional purposes in the body. And all of that's broken down in the book. But the thing is, um, understanding the most appropriate way to fuel yourself is so important. It's so important. And it, it's funny that you said you like foods that are high in fat and high in carb because nowhere in nature do high fat, high carb foods exist. That's actually like a manufactured thing. And here in America, we call it the standard American diet because anything that's high fat and high carb tastes delicious. 
you know what I'm saying? It tastes good, but it's also a recipe for fat gain. And again, there's nothing wrong with high fat, high carb food, but you don't find it anywhere in nature. And, you know, that approach tends to lead most people towards fat gain. So eating, say, fruits and vegetables mm-hmm. that, you know, would still be classed as carbohydrates, not necessarily mm-hmm. like for me, I yes, I, I do indulge mm-hmm. in, in cookies and donuts from time oh, to really? time. But for the most part, I'm eating vegetables, fruits, mm-hmm. um, and then my cheese, I love my cheese, my nuts, my seeds, mm-hmm. all those sorts of things. And then, yeah, it's a... And and butter, <laughs> I can't forget butter. So all those things, they're not necessarily good for, they, they do end up leading to fat gain. Is that what you're? Uh, no. So the thing is when you have foods that are high fat and high carb together, uh-huh. tends to lead to fat gain. So thinking more like French fries, potato chips, like cook, like things that are naturally high fat, high carb, that tends to be the path of fat gain, especially obviously when in eating in a caloric surplus as well, of course. Yeah. So eating, say, for example, high amount, like an over, over amount mm-hmm. of fruit and vegetables mixed with fat, that's not going to lead to weight gain or is it? Um, well, the thing is, uh, the, the most important thing obviously is you do need to be, your calorie intake does matter for sure. So you need to be eating at a, in a way that is designed to support your maintenance calories if your goal is to maintain in a caloric deficit if you are seeking to gain to lose body fat or a surplus if you're seeking to gain the thing is you know when you go high carb high fat it does especially high carb if you are in surplus and you are not active carbohydrates do trigger the body's storage mechanism for fat so you know that insulin spike like carbs are great for muscle building, but they also have, there's a double-edged sword to carbohydrates where you exceed the capacity for muscle storage, muscle growth, that spillover quantity is going to trigger fat storage. Mm. I thought protein, so here's the thing, I thought protein was more for building muscle than carbs. So have I got both it all? Of them. Yeah, so both, both of them are responsible. So protein is definitely responsible for Uh, muscle recovery, muscle growth, but protein and carbs work together because glycogen, which is the stored form of carbohydrates is stored inside the muscle cells. So if you just ate high protein without having an appropriate amount of carbs to balance it, your muscles would look very flat. And that's one thing that bodybuilders do like right before the show, they, they, they deplete, they deplete, they deplete, and then they refill back up with carbohydrates to boost that muscle volume. Um, right before stage. Ah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So for the caloric intake, Mm -hmm. I mean, how do we determine how much each person is meant to intake on a daily basis? Yeah, that's a really good question. I have that all broken down in chapter six, I believe. And the way we do it is you need to know your BMR, which is your basal metabolic rate, how many calories you need to sustain your current body mass at rest. And I specify current because so many people think that if they eat below their BMR, that they're, they're going to be doing some terrible metabolic damage. And that's not the case. Cause for instance, let's say hypothetically you weigh 300 pounds, your BMR is going to be based off of a 300 pound person. That's not a BMR that you want to sustain, if that makes sense. You know, so your basal metabolic rate is how many calories you need to sustain your body, assuming you were at rest 24 hours and did zero movement. You know that value, you then apply an activity factor, or it's basically just adding up the the calories from movement activity. Those two things together, that's your total daily energy expenditure. That's how many calories to sustain you. From there, a caloric deficit is taken from that point, from the TDEE. So if you want to lose one pound of body fat per week, one pound of body fat is 3,500 calories over seven days divided by seven. That's a 500 calorie deficit per day. You take that value minus 500. Now that gives you your starting calories. So that's okay. This is what we do with the calories, but we know calories are made of proteins, carbs, and fats. How you break those apart is based off of your macro type, but what's going to make the most sense for you. Ah, 
that all sounds completely scientific. Yeah, very logical. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there an easier way to sort of break it down for people that might um, help or is. Um, I've, I've tried, I feel like that's probably like the simplest way to, to make it honestly, because it is math. It is science. It's not rocket science. I think it's, you know, there are equations, but I think that people should be able to wrap their head around how their body functions. Mm. And I think that so many people try to dumb it down like way too much for folks. And I mean, again, like not everybody is going to be like wanting to know what the cells do on a biochemical level, but I think that we need to give folks more credit to being able to grasp how their body functions. You know what I mean? We're just saying your body needs so much energy to live. Your activity adds to, to how much energy you need. You add those two up and then you just do a deficit from there and it's templated out. You know, people can plug in their numbers and figure it out um, in the book. And I have lots of YouTube videos on it as well um, for people who like to you know, be more visual with it as well. Mm. For the different types of body types, I know there's, mm -hmm. there's three main ones out mm -hmm. there. Um, can you just, can you say mm -hmm. what they are and how each one affects the macro type in terms of being able to lose weight, burn fat, and be at optimal levels? So there are three main body types and the, the body typing theory was based on um, Sheldon, who was um, a researcher more and actually in human behavior and physiology, um, who initially thought that, you know, the categorization of human anatomy, he initially thought that it had stuff to do with the, the behavior of people, um, and that obviously was debunked. However, there was some merit to body typing from a human physiology perspective. So there are endomorphs, mesomorphs, and ectomorphs. And endomorphs have a tendency to gain muscle very easily. They struggle to lose fat. Mesomorphs gain muscle easily, lose fat pretty easily. Um, and ectomorphs are hard gainers, really struggle to gain um, muscle, lose fat very easily. So the problem with body typing alone is that people say, okay, endomorphs should probably go lower carb, mesomorphs probably go moderate carb, ectomorphs need to go higher in carb. And that's been the general principle. But in my coaching experience, one on one, it got to a point where that was like the rule of thumb I used for many years. But then I just kept having exceptions to the rule, exceptions to the rule, exceptions to the rule where I couldn't just look at somebody and say, okay, you're a mesomorph, eat moderate carbs, but yet all of their labs say, well, this person's got a thyroid issue. This person's got hormone issues. This person's got this, this, and this. They actually shouldn't be eating that type of carb. They should be doing this. Or conversely, I've had folks who are endomorphs who technically they're supposed to struggle to lose weight, but I've had endomorphs not struggle losing weight and they're fine with carbs. So I'm like, if I'm going to, you know, utilize these principles, they have to be more universal. And I think from a training perspective, I think it's, it's a good starting point to give people realistic expectations of what they can accomplish. But from a perspective of how should you eat, it just falls so flat. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's just, it's not in depth enough. I think I'm kind of like in the middle. I think mesomorph. Mesomorph. That's yeah, there's a middle one. Yeah. <laughs> uh can can you go across two? Like can you have two body types? Yes. And can you change yep. your body you type? Absolutely. You could change your body type. You can be a combination of both. And because I've just seen so much of that over the years, I found it to be way more meaningful to categorize people based off of their carb tolerance because that really helps me figure out how to write macros and plans that's actually going to get the person results because that's what people want at the end of the day like having like a cute label for something people kind of like putting themselves in the boxes which is great but understanding your carb tolerance is going to really help you unlock your macro type learning basically all a macro type is is just telling you which macros you need to be having in the dominant quantities are you primarily fueled by fats? Are you primarily fueled by proteins? Or are you primarily fueled by carbs? And I think that so many folks, once they realize, oh, 
that's what works for me. They feel seen. They feel like a sense of peace that like, they're not crazy that because, you know, in the same household, there are people who cannot eat the same way. Right. And it drives people nuts. Some people just cannot eat the way their partner can eat. They need to be more mindful of certain foods. And that's okay because this is the way your body functions. And I think there's a lot of acceptance in that. There's a lot of beauty in that. There's a lot of peace that comes from knowing, man, this is what I should be eating. And I encourage people to look at this, not from a take away from the plate mentality. I look at it from a, what should you add the plate? What foods should you be embracing as opposed to, uh, don't eat this, don't eat that. It's no, it's your body just does better when you eat according to what you need. Does the timing of when you eat, does that matter in terms of? Um, It does to a certain extent. Um, If folks who are more on the fat fueled end of the spectrum, where they have the lower carbohydrate tolerances, um, they tend to do better optimizing meal timing, specifically the timing of carbohydrates, because just because you have low carb tolerance doesn't mean you should eat no carbs. It just means you know, eat your carbs before and after the workout where your, your window is going to be much higher to be able to absorb the carbohydrates Mm -hmm. and your, your carb tolerance window actually changes because your carb tolerance actually increases post-workout. So your body's going to take those carbohydrates and utilize them for replenishing, um, glycogen. Mm. I noticed because I can't eat past a certain time. It's just Mm -hmm. part of my autoimmune, sadly. Mm -hmm. Um, which sucks because I want to be able to eat past 7 p.m. <laughs> and I can't, like it hurts. Mm. But, yeah, I, I like how you you explained all that. It makes a lot of sense to me. And even yeah. going back to um, understanding caloric intake, I mean, I understood mm. it. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you have this, this brand new book out called Unlock Your Macro Type. It's coming out the 8th of March, so it'll be around the time this uh, episode drops for people so they can go and get a copy of it anywhere books are sold. I'll make sure everyone knows where to get it. But why did you decide to write this book in the first place? Because it's no easy thing to write a book. And we're just speaking off air uh, how difficult it was for you to get this book officially done. Yeah. um, The reason why I wanted to write this book is because I don't feel like there are good nutrition resources out there. Um, there just aren't a lot of the the resources out there. Not only are they very dated, they're very one dimensional. They're very eat this way that worked for me, eat this way that worked for me. And the thing is there needed to be a broader book that can contextualize all diets. Because the thing is like every diet can be broken down into the macro type. You know what I'm saying? Any diet, a keto diet, a South beach diet, a vegan diet, it's, and the thing is, like, for instance, a vegan, a vegan diet tends to be high carb. And there are folks who are carb dom- carb fueled, and they will do great on that. Likewise, there's other folks who, like, keto is a perfect example. Like, that can work well for people who have a fat fueled macro type. And there just needed to be something that contextualizes everything in a very, like, just simple, methodical way. And I felt like that resource didn't exist. And I wanted to create something meaningful to really help people navigate the science because I get so frustrated when I just hear like how magazine speak, if you know what I'm talking about, just that the people who kind of speak in the way that like their opinion is fact without any research, without any backing that very autocratic because I said so type of a way, like that doesn't actually help people, you know, like there's just so many influences and gurus out there. They're like, do it this way, do it this way. And I'm not telling anybody to do it any which way I'm saying, you know what, let's learn about you, how your body performs in quantifiable ways. And let's look at what the research says and then make a decision off of that. Mm-hmm. And I, f- I feel like it was my finest effort to be able to do that. And the thing is, I probably, I wrote this book so many times it, this book existed in so many different forms, but I feel like the form that I finally landed on 
is going to have the most utility for people in a very, very practical way. Because the thing is, I could have written this at a very like PhD level from one researcher to another. That doesn't help people. It needs to be digestible. It needs to be in a way that people can be like, oh, okay, I see me in here. That's what I should do. And then go about their day because um, there are resources out there that are good, but it's just written at such a high level that like no one's going to do anything practical with it. Mm. So I wanted to find something that really, I wanted to create something that took science and just made it accessible to anybody, to anybody. Mm. You've also got a bunch of questionnaires. Yes. There's quizzes in there. Yep. And quizzes, I think is is pretty cool. So you're testing yourself. Um, I think, one of the things that I like about this book is I, I have what I call the freedom diet and mm-hmm. I, it, I eat what works for me and my oh. body type and I guess my macro type as mm-hmm. well. So I like how you've incorporated everything, all diets mm-hmm. can be incorporated into the macro type, mm-hmm. including my freedom diet. <laughs> well, it's so, true though. Absolutely. I think it's, um, yeah, it's going to be beneficial for a lot of people, whatever diet they're on at the moment, just to understand this a lot better. Um, and like you said, you could have written it from a scientific standpoint, but then people would have just tuned out probably. Exactly. Um, yep. And the the thing, I, I, I feel like this book is literally like a love letter to my YouTube followers because I've been making YouTube videos for the last decade and the questions I get in the comment sections, the feedback, that iterative back and forth, like the people tell me what they're confused about. You know what I'm saying? And the questions they ask, like there is no stupid question. If you don't understand something, then I need to be doing a better job explaining it in a way that you can grasp it. And I just find that Social media is such a beautiful, um, like test study, like case studies, like it, uh, it's, it uh, just allows us as content creators, if we really want to help people listen to the people, like listen to what they're saying, listen to what their questions are, because that's where we need to be educating more and creating content on and doing podcasts on and doing, they're going to tell you what they don't know. And when I realized all the questions people had, I was just like, I literally went, when I started writing this book, I went through all of my YouTube comments and I picked out all the questions and I just wrote them down. I had them everywhere plastered. And I was like, how can I answer all these questions? Like, how can I take some questions that are under a similar context? And like, what do people really want? And, and that that's how I wrote this book. Mm. Was there a question in there that you couldn't answer? Um, not that I could think of. No, <laughs> it's it's all hashed out. Good. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Well done. Yeah. Um, Christine, I people can go and get a copy of this book wherever books are sold, but where else do you want people to find you, you know, and and, and learn more about your work? Yeah. So you guys can find me on YouTube, um, the Gage Girl Training YouTube channel. Um, you guys can find me on Instagram at Gage Girl Training. And um, you guys can visit my website, gagegirltraining.com. And I've officially ventured into the TikTok world, Gage Girl Training as well. And uh, I'm not too old to learn new tricks, so. (laughs) Well, you're ahead of me, to be honest. I don't have TikTok. (laughs) So well done. people are. Thank you. (laughs) Um, Christine, this is my final question that I love asking all my guests at the very end of every conversation that I have. It's a hypothetical one, but I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. All your friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it magic for the sake of argument, but they've been able to get it and show it to you on your hundredth birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? I wanted to show that I helped others and in some way, like, like kind of circling back to the beginning that, you know, 
I'm a very hard worker. I'm actually a little introverted and awkward. I, I can do fine and these types of things, but I just want people to know that I truly wanted to help others and that I genuinely cared. That's it. It's a, a great send off message for people. Christine, thank you so much for thank your time you. today, your wisdom and your advice and for joining me today on the Storybox podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Jay.